My name is Mark Syme, the minister of the Northfield Church of Christ in Northfield, New Jersey. And I would like to take this opportunity to welcome all of you to our evening services for Sunday, May the 7th. We'll sing a few songs. We will have the Lord's Supper. And I have a message for you that I hope will be enlightening and uh, useful to each of us. We sing at our church from Songs of Faith and Praise. I will give you the name of the song and the number. Uh, if you don't have this book, perhaps you can either Google the song or you have a song book that you can find the same song. The first song we will sing is number 97, I Sing Praises. 97, I Sing Praises. <clears throat> I sing praises to your name, O Lord, praises to your name, O Lord, for your name is great and greatly to be praised. I sing praises to your name, O Lord, praises to your name, O Lord, for your name is great and greatly to be praised. I give glory to your name, O Lord, glory to your name, O Lord, for your name is great and greatly to be praised. I give glory to your name, O Lord, glory to your name, O Lord, for your name is great and greatly to be praised. The next song we'll sing is one hopefully you all know. It's called Be Still and Know. It is number 31 in our books. Be Still and Know. 31. Be Still and Know. <clears throat> Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. I am the Lord that strengthens thee. I am the Lord that strengthens thee. I am the Lord that strengthens thee. And before the Lord's Supper, we will sing number 300. And 66, 366, the title is By Christ Redeemed, 366, By Christ Redeemed. <clears throat> By Christ redeemed and Christ restored. We keep the supper of the Lord and show the death of our dear Lord until He come. His body given in our stead is seen in this memorial bread. And as we drink, we see the blood until we 
drum, and thus that dark betray all night with the last advent we unite. By one bright chain of loving right until he comes. In the 20th chapter of the book of Acts, in the 7th verse, it says that they gathered together on the first day of the week to break bread. Uh, that, to me and to the Christian world, means that on the first day of the week, they remembered the Lord in his supper, the supper that he instituted on the night he was betrayed during the Passover season, the uh, uh, Lord's Supper, which the Apostle Paul in the 11th chapter of 1 Corinthians uh, also uh, recounted for us to show us exactly how we are to memorialize Jesus and his death upon the cross. Uh, the the song that we just sang has some very poignant words about the Lord's Supper. It says, His body given in our stead is seen in this memorial bread. As we partake of the bread, we are to give pause and think of the body of our Lord as he suffered on the cross as a human being, feeling all the pain that uh, you and I would feel. Uh, it is hard to even imagine how agonizing this form of Roman cap uh, capital punishment was. It was the most gruesome of ways to die. And Jesus' body must have suffered greatly. So as we partake of the bread, uh, let's think of his body. Let's pray. We just thank you so much, dear God, as part of your divine plan that you sent Jesus into the world while we were yet sinners, and that uh, you knew what his physical fate would be as the Son of Man. And uh, we just give praise that Jesus was willing to sacrifice his body for us. So as we partake of this bread, let's remember the agonizing moments and hours that Jesus spent on that cross for us. We pray this in his most holy name. Amen. The song by Christ Redeemed continues after it says his body given in our stead is seen in this memorial bread. It says, and as we drink, we see the blood until he come. And so uh, as we partake of the fruit of the vine, we are thinking of the blood, the innocent blood that Jesus shed for each one of us. Uh, the life-giving blood that flowed from his body just as it would from ours if we were uh, injured uh, in some way. Uh, the blood that uh, carries all of the necessary things to our bodies so that life may continue to go on. And this just drained from Jesus' body. So as we partake of the fruit of the vine, let's remember that wonderful blood that washes away our sins. Let's pray. We just pause to give thanks for uh, the blood that Jesus shed for each one of us. And as we picture that, the blood flowing from his head and from his hands and his feet and his side, we remember that Jesus was willing to do that for each one of us, that we might have our sins forgiven, that we might one day live with you forever. As we drink, help us to remember and help us to understand the magnitude of its importance. We pray this in his most holy name. Amen. <clears throat> Having completed the Lord's Supper, we have one other thing that uh, we are to do each first day of the week. And that is that we are get to give back to the Lord. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, 
uh, it explains very, very succinctly to us that uh, we are to lay by and store that which we have been prospered. There's a great deal in that short sentence, isn't there? We are to lay by and store. That means planning. That means that each first day that we, we plan to give. And how much do we give? We give as we have been prospered. We have examples of those in our New Testament who gave beyond what they were prospered. In the first century, we had uh, uh, Christians uh, in the very, very beginning, in the first few days, selling the things that they had, selling fields, selling properties, and laying the money at the apostles' feet. We have that wonderful example of the widow putting her last two uh, small cents into the treasury, all that she had. And to, we're not told to do that. We're told to lay by in store that which we have been prospered. So as we give, help us to give with that in mind and help us to give as it has been told, told to us in a cheerful manner, knowing that the monies will be used to, to bring others to Christ. Let's pray. We just thank you to Heavenly Father that uh, we are able to give. We thank you that we are willing to give. Help us indeed each week to lay by in store. Help us to understand how much we have prospered. And help us to understand that every good thing and every good gift comes from you above. Help us to understand that all of these things that we give are indeed temporary. And, and help us to understand that uh, <clears throat> uh, monies need to be used so that the church may be able to function the way it should. Bless us in our giving. We pray this in his most holy name. Amen. The last song that we'll sing is number 770, one of my favorites. It is Dear Lord and Father of Mankind. Words of this song were written by the American poet John Greenleaf Whittier. <clears throat> Dear Lord and Father of mankind, forgive our foolish ways. Reclaw us in a rightful mind, in your life's thy service, find in deeper reverence, praise, in simple trust like theirs who heard beside the Syrian sea. The gracious calling of the Lord let us like them without a word rise up and follow Sabbath rest my Galilee, O God of hills above, where Jesus now to share with thee the silence of eternity interpreted by love drop thy still dews of quietness till all our striving cease Take from our souls the strain and 
stress and let our ordered lives confess the beauty of thy peace. I hope you enjoyed singing as much as I did. And I know the Lord was praised in our song and I just uh, hope that uh, we had the right frame of mind and uh, I know that we gave praise to the Lord the way that we're supposed to. If you were there this morning, you heard that the lesson uh, this evening would be about recognition or maybe in some ways taking credit for things. In Matthew chapter 6 and verse 1 in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by men. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Those are some heavy words there, aren't they? That means even if you do good deeds, if you do them from the wrong perspective, if you do them for the wrong reason, God's not interested. <laughs> it's not me talking. It's the scripture talking. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven if we do these to be seen by men rather than be seen by God. To me, uh, sometimes that kind of means taking credit for things when we shouldn't take credit for things. I'll get back to that in just a few minutes. Nothing really, I don't think, tests our character more than having to choose between what our motives are. What are our motives? When there is a good deed to be done, for example, our character is tested. Will we do it simply to glorify God? Or will we do it to be seen by men? It's a hard choice. It's a choice that sometimes we have to admit is harder than <laughs> many of us are willing to admit. Now, praise itself is not evil. We just spent a few moments in song praising the Lord. But there's no denying that it has the potential to help us if praise is misdirected. Now, to me, uh, I think it is indeed uh, a rare person who can receive more than a moderate amount of recognition and not have his or her attitude marred by it. You know, we, we look all around us and we see highways and monuments dedicated to great people. We have a Washington monument in DC. We have the Jefferson Memorial. All right. We have the Lincoln Memorial. We have an airport in Washington DC named after President Ronald Reagan. We have Dulles International Airport, uh, uh, named after John Foster Dulles, a great ambassador. I mean, there are, there are things all around where people have gained recognition. They gained recognition for what they had did. Now, I'm not indicting any of those people. I'm not saying that any of those people did the right things for the wrong reasons. I'm just saying that we have esteemed them for what they have done. Um, uh, and, and, you know, there's always that little part of us that says after we've done something that wants us to get that little, little jab in there. And, and we don't maybe say it in so many words, but we look at it and we say, see what I just did? Wasn't that, wasn't that good? Well, we don't need to do that. We need to do good things because good things need to be done. The philosopher Norman Vincent Peale put it this way, 
most of us would rather be ruined by praise than saved by criticism. As for motives that I talked about a moment ago, it's hard to be honest as to what they really are, isn't it? It's always difficult when we do something, especially if we try to do something good. What are the motives? Are we doing that good for the betterment of someone else? Or are we doing it just to make ourselves feel good? The desire to be noticed and recognized as having something good can be so subtle that our motive may be tinged. And, and we might even say, no, 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 no. I didn't do that. I, I didn't mean that. But yet there's a little piece of us that takes the wrong attitude. In, in a given situation, it's difficult to see when the thing we really want is to be praised. We want that pat on the back. We want the boss to say, a boy." We want him to say, job well done. We need to go about our business doing good things because we're supposed to be doing good things, not for the attaboys and the pats on the back. Maybe for us today in 2023, um, maybe stating to be seen by men is, 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 is a little strong. But what about the word recognized? Now, to be seen by men and recognized by men, do you see the subtle little differences? A, a little appreciation, unfortunately, can be an intoxicating thing. And once we've experienced it, and it starts back in our childhood, it's easy for that to become the payoff. And then every transaction, we expect something. We didn't want our children to get good grades because we promised them an amount of money for every A, even though we might do it or maybe had done it. We want them to make good grades because it's what they ought to do. That's what their schooling is all about. Hmm. The needs of self, including the need to be appreciated, obviously are not unimportant. Hebrews uh, chapter 10 verse 24 says, for us to uh, encourage one another toward love and good deeds. That's our job. Our job is to encourage one another toward love and good deeds. But I believe that God has set up reality such as self-needs that are satisfied when we put our priorities where our priorities ought to be. Maybe the verse in the Bible that puts it the best is Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, that says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and these things will be added. So let's make sure we're completely honest with ourselves. Why do we do what we do for God? Do we serve him loyally as something that is actually private rather than public? If no one ever noticed the good things that we do, would be, would we be satisfied? Would we be satisfied to know that God recognized that I had done it and God knows that I did it to glorify him? If then, we would uh, avoid the opposite. One of the attitudes 
<laughs> and it's personal with me, I'm sorry, uh, about famous people is that sometimes they seem to be smug, right? You know that smug thing? You know, it's one of those, you know, I'm doing real well, and they sit back and they have that kind of look on their face, uh, like uh, like we put our thumb in and we pulled out the plum and, and said, what a good boy am I? And And most of us don't like smugness. And most of us don't like the idea of people doing things for the wrong reasons. Finally, taking credit for things is something that, you know, we, we deal with all the time. We cook a good meal and we take credit for it. Look what a great meal that was. Uh, we get a bonus at work and we say, boy, I must have really done something good to earn that bonus. And you know what? We're almost trained in our country to, to feel that way about things. What is it about giving credit? I'd like us to turn to the book of Daniel as we complete the lesson this evening. Uh, in Daniel, we see a guy who is accustomed to giving God the credit for the success that he had. In this book, Daniel and three of his other cohorts were promoted to work for the king uh, on a personal level. In the second chapter of Daniel, the, the king had a crazy dream, and it was indeed a, 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 a nutso dream, and he's trying to figure out what it means. So, you know, in the multi-religious world of that time, he called together all of his magicians and conjurers and wise men, and the king decides that they will certainly know the answer to this, and they don't. And, uh, the king decides that they, they need to be killed. <laughs> the king had, uh, amazing powers in, in those days and times. And then enter Daniel. Daniel decided, uh, to pray to God to ask him for the ability to interpret this dream. He told the king, he said, there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries and has revealed it to him. And with that, Daniel immediately recited the dream. And he told the king exactly what the dream meant. At the end of this interpretation, and here we go, Daniel could have said, like the boy putting putting his thumb in the pie and pulling out the plum. Oh, king, ain't I good? <laughs> Look at how good I am. I interpreted your dream. This is me, Daniel. You had a dream. You went to everybody, and I'm the one that did it. But in Daniel chapter 2, verse 45, he says, the great God has made known to the king what will take place in the future. You know, uh, Daniel could have said, you know, king, <laughs> I've been around here all week. If you have any dreams, come to me. I'll interpret them for you. And he could have just said, you know, I'm, I'm really good at this. But he gave credit to God. And the king's response was even greater because he didn't necessarily give credit to Daniel, but he gave credit to God because God, Daniel laid it on the line and told him where it came from. The king said, surely your God is a God of gods and a Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, since you have been able to reveal this mystery. And with that, we come back to the original premise about recognition. How many times in our lives when something great happens that we forget to give God the credit? 
It is something for us this evening to really ponder and to really think about the good things that happen to us and happen to us for a reason. I look at some of the pivotal things that happen in my life and I understand that they happened for a reason and that God had a part in them. I hope that this lesson was uh, important enough for each of us that each of us will um, think about why we do things and that we do things for the right reason. If you are not a child of God, we offer you the invitation this evening. If you need to come to the Lord, confess that Jesus is the Son of God and be baptized for the remission of your sins. I pray that you will make that decision. We are at your beck and call. Let's pray together as we close. Our God and Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for the time that we've had this evening to sing praises to your name, observe the Lord's Supper, and then uh, listen to a portion of your word. I pray that the lesson will take heart, that we will come to understand that we do and we should do things for the reasons that are correct. And those reasons are to glorify God who should get all the credit. Bless us in our lives to do what we do for uh, not getting patted on the back, but knowing that that is what we should do to live a godly life. Bless us in our lives as we put our heads on our pillows this evening. Help us to remember that you are our God and that all things come to you. Continue to bless us. We pray this in his most holy name. Amen. Please be safe and may God bless you all. Oh.